What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Lindy's Leans, Likes, and Locks here on the Odd Shopper channel. Hit that like button, subscribe button, and notification bell. That goes a long way for all of us over here, and then you can know whenever the great content here at the Odd Shopper channel is going live. Uh, looking forward to today's slate. we got a big one here on Friday, July 29th. I'm excited. You know what? Why don't we just get to the picks? We kick off the weekend with no official starter here for the Orioles in this Cincinnati matchup, and therefore, no line is out in this one. But Twitter tells me it should be Dean Kramer on the mound, and the internet never lies, so that's what I'm running with for now. Let's assume he's who's taking the bump and adjust tomorrow if that changes. Kramer looks to have a serviceable 3.06 ERA, but to say that's lucky would be a little bit of an understatement. His 5.22 expected ERA is grotesque and would be actual improvement off of his 2021 numbers where he sported a somehow worse 6.43 expected ERA. Which brings me to this. Don't look at actual ERA as an indicator of just about anything that's going to happen in the future. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. And on the other side of this one, in Great American Small Park, is one Mike Miner, who has been bit hit hard by the regression bug in 2022, a 485 expected slugging, a 347 X Woba, along with a 19% K rate and 8.8% walk rate, just brutal numbers. Plus, all the hard contact he's giving up is going high and far, which has led to 14 home runs on this season, 10 of which have come when pitching at home. Great American small park for a reason. But the big thing here is just how bad Miner is versus right-handed batters this season. A 452 Woba, a 7.93 FIP, and a 1.90 whip are eye-popping bad. And in the projected lineup I've got for Baltimore, it looks like Cedric Mullins should be the only lefty that Miner gets to deal with, and Mullins is actually good. So we have to sit and twiddle our thumbs until the book comes out with a number here. But I am so inclined to jam Baltimore. It's not even funny. Just can't go about doing it until we see what that number is that gets posted by the books. See if it makes sense to attack. But as always, you can hit me up in the comments section below or on Twitter at Eric Lindquist to confirm whether or not it makes sense to add this to the card. But something tells me we definitely want to be doing that. It is a lock for in the future it's a lean as it stands right now but baltimore money line lean we got two starters announced in this one that are really good it's the mets it's the marlins it's chris bassett on the road against sandy alcantara here it's an even better ballpark for chris bassett we'll start with him uh it's such an atrocious lineup that the marlins are putting out day in day out in fact their best hitter might already be this J.J. Blade character who got called up less than a week ago. He's a top five pick out of Vanderbilt who looks like he has some pop in his bat from the left side. But let's be serious. I'm going to side with Bassett's track record over Blade any day. <laughs> I'm funny. He keeps batters down to a mere 33.8% hard hit rate at 355 expected slugging and strikes out 25.8% of batters in the process. And to top it off, his 3.13 expected ERA is a smidge below his 3.72 ERA for this year, showing that he's perhaps a bit unlucky despite some already solid surface stats. Still, he's no doubt the second most interesting pitcher in this game because Sal Sandy Alcantara is the runaway favorite to take home the NL Cy Young at this point of the season. I bring this up frequently because it's fun, but since May 11th, the Marlins ace has gone at least six innings in every single outing and has converted all but one of those into a quality start. He strikes out batters at just a 24.3% clip, which amongst elite pitchers isn't all that high, but his high 90s heat does keep them off balance, and he locates it well. He's just a monster, y'all. But the Mets, with their drastically better lineup, are road favorites here, and that's just not something I'm comfortable at betting either direction. The total, however, is a different story. I know 6.5 is insanely low. But it's juiced towards the under, and barring a Mets offensive explosion out of nowhere, I don't see how the Marlins get anything of note here against Bassett. So we've got an early lock on the board here today, folks. If only, because getting plus money on the under here grades out far too good of a value to pass up for me. Again, that is the under of six and a half runs, friends. Lock it up. Guys, I'm telling you right now, we have three days left. Three days to sign up over at BetMGM using promo code Lindy. There is a link in the description box below. And as much as I believe in my plays, I believe that I can make you money over a long period of time. I can guarantee you money by betting $10 over at BetMGM today and getting $200 free dollars to play with. There are no strings attached. This is not a joke. 
you can absolutely get a guaranteed win before you even start your day by signing up over at BetMGM using promo code Lindy. Bet $10 on any money line play period that exists on the board, and $200 will be put into your account. No strings attached. All right, y'all. You know what to do. Go take advantage of that, and let's get back to the picks. We go to Yankee Stadium next, and I just got to say before we start, it's funny. I recorded my breakdown of this matchup yesterday and said it would be an audition for Andrew Benintendi, only to see him get traded to the pinstripes an hour later. Well, no denying he's on the better team now, and that is well represented by the books to say the least here. In fact, minus 350 is by far the biggest favorite we've had on the board since the inception of this video series, and you'll be hard-pressed to see this big of a favorite again the rest of the year. That's because... Chris Bubich of the Royals is very bad at pitching baseballs, and despite some early season struggles again for Garrett Cole, he is one of the best at it. Starting with Bubich, don't let his last two outings fool you. He's not good. His 365 x Woba, 463 expected slugging, and 47.2% hard hit rate spells disaster against this powerful Yankees lineup, especially considering his inability to miss bats with a paltry 17.7% K rate on the year. And with Garrett Cole, it's just Garrett Cole. He's rounded into form as the year's gone on. And with his 32.3% K rate against this now Benintendi list Royals lineup, he should be met with very little resistance. The age old question here, though, is this one, can you possibly lay any team in baseball as a minus 350 favorite? And two, does the minus one and a half Yankees play have enough value there to be viable considering the hefty minus 155 or minus 160 juice you're paying? I'm a bit torn here. And there is a sick part of me that would consider some sort of a massive alternate spread, like a minus two and a half or minus three and a half Yankees line, if it's available at your book. But every projection site on earth that I've looked at tonight gives the Yankees around an 80% actual chance to win this game, which means minus 350 is technically value, even if that sounds stupid to say out loud. But utilizing the expected value calculator on Odd Shopper in the top left corner of your screen at Odd Shopper, you can find. 80% for a win probability when you put it in and minus 350 for the odds on a standard $100 wager, which is coming out to a 2.86% expected ROI. Now, that's not enough of an expected ROI to go crazy with it, but it does prove that if you want to put a few of my favorite plays together in a parlay, which I know a lot of you do, love the screenshots, I'm happy to make the Yankees money line play a part of it. More than anything, I hope talking through the process of this play is a little bit more helpful for you long-term than just saying, oh man, that's a fish player. Dogs have been killing it lately. Let's go with the Royals. Let's just try to make the best decisions in every spot as often as we possibly can. And with that logic in mind, let's not get cute here. Let's still take this money line on the Yankees. In other words, sometimes the obvious play is the right play, like it is in this spot, a like play on the Yankees money line. Next up, Phillies, Pittsburgh. We've got the Phillies in Pittsburgh, where something named a Bailey Falter will be facing a southpaw, Jose Quintana. And apologies to Falter's parents, but he really sucks at pitching. His 5.79 expected ERA shows actual regression coming for him. 5.18 ERA, actually, so he's going to get worse than that. That's actually sad. He's giving up an eye-popping 525 expected slugging and a 398 Woba in the process, and it just makes me a bit nauseous. And even though he's a major league pitcher with a fastball topping out at 91, he still doesn't offer any sort of a plus off-speed pitch. So he's got little to no chance of being a serviceable big league arm ever, which sounds harsh, but life is harsh, kids. Anyways, the one thing he's got going for him in this spot is the Pittsburgh lineup, of course. Third worst in baseball against lefties with an 83 WRC+. Plus. Although their 149 ISO against that handedness indicates they can have some middle-of-the-road success and pop. Still, I think I'm going to have to back the underdog Pirates in this spot. And not because I think Quintana's a pitcher that I ever want to back at this stage of his career. But I think Quintana might try and show out just a little bit here. Not to go too far down Nair's street, but he wants someone, anyone, to maybe come snag him before the deadline. His contract is up in 2023. And with just a $2 million base salary, this is a showcase game for sure from the Pirates who want to try to get anything in return for his very, very average services. Again, I'm not narrative-based nearly as much as I am numbers-based, but Quintana does limit major uh, hard contact, 37.4% hard hit rate on the year, 
And despite his propensity to give up pitches that should result in hits with his 265 X, uh, X batting average, he's just finding ways to survive here of late. So still, while Philly has some decent lefty killers and proves it with their 111 uh, WRC plus against that handedness as a team, I like the plus money that we're getting here on the Bucks. So don't get crazy, but it grades out as a solid bet for me. That's the Pittsburgh Pirates money line. It's a like. To Washington we go, where the Cardinals get back their two stars after a trip across the border without them. Yes, Nolan Arenado and Paul Goldschmidt will be returning to this Cardinals lineup that didn't have any problem without them last night in a 6-1 upset of the Blue Jays. And I wish I had bet the Cardinals money line instead of the plus one and a half with them. But hey, a win's a win. Not going to complain, so we continue on. On to today, the Cards put their best starter on the mountain miles, Michaelis against Washington's not best starter in Annabelle Sanchez. And let's be serious here. The Nats are far more concerned with how and where to ship their pieces than anything else uh, that has to do with winning a ball game at the moment. And it's not like Juan Soto or Josh Bell or Nelson Cruz need to quote unquote show out to be considered buyers on this market. My major concern would be some combination of them sitting randomly here or just basically looking at a wonky lineup without one of them. So want to be ready to react to any kind of a strange happening or if one of them gets traded randomly on Friday. So sorry to get sidetracked again there. We're back to the pitchers. Miles Michaelis, he's the best pitcher that the cards have to offer despite a sub 20% K rate. And he keeps the ball in the yard. Uh, He doesn't really give up free passes with his 5.1% walk rate. As for Annabelle Sanchez, he's been super unlucky in his two starts, a stat cast shows him to have just a 2.91 expected ERA, despite his 6.30 ERA he's had through 12 innings. But he's 38 now, and he was never really good at any other point in his career. So I'm more inclined to think we see some brutal shellings of him sooner rather than later. Now, there is expected to be some bad weather here in D.C., and the Nats are notoriously quick to pull the trigger in spots like this if there are some lingering storms in the afternoon. But assuming this game plays... It's supposed to be 80 and humid at first pitch, decent enough offensive conditions for both teams. And with some nine totals lingering around the board, I might be interested in pulling the trigger on an overplay if the usual suspects for the Nats, especially Juan Soto, are in the lineup for them. I'm calling it a lean for now because I doubt this line changes much uh, unless there's a major move in the afternoon. But more than likely, we'll still be able to bet this number later on in the day. So take your time. It's not of the essence, like it it will still be uh, sitting at nine here unless you see that wild happening. So just keep that in mind. The over would get the like treatment for me, but I want to make sure nothing funky happens throughout the days. I want to see these two lineup cards, then I'll hit the over on nine. Oh, look, another game where Toronto is a massive favorite. They'll be put through the AL East gauntlet soon enough, but feels like they've been served up nonstop cake cream puff matchups this entire week. And Friday is no different. Let's start with the Tigers side here. The road team, uh, Brian Garcia on the mound for Detroit. And this will be his first crack at the rotation in 2022. And while he, I don't even know why he's getting this shot. I I was going to say something funny, but at AAA, it's not been funny. He's got a 6.07 XFIP and an 8.36 expected ERA and 40 and a third innings. In other words, he's the worst pitcher in the history of humanity. And this Toronto team, should make his life miserable. Oh, and on the other side is a fantastic starting pitcher in Alec Manoa with a 28.1% hard hit rate that damn near is the best rate in baseball, all against, uh, all amongst all the starting pitchers. He doesn't strike out a bajillion batters with a 23% K rate, but I'm absolutely in on the Blue Jays minus one and a half run line, no matter where this line opens, because he's a righty against the worst team in baseball. (laughs) I don't even know how to even bring this up. Uh, that's not even mentioning the m- mismatch of epic proportions that is this Toronto lineup against this Garcia fellow. So again, no line here means I have to give it the auto lean status, but it's hard to imagine a world where I don't jam minus one and a half Toronto here every single time, unless the line opens with that run line above minus 175, which feels really unlikely based on the Yankees line above it. So lean Toronto minus one and a half as it stands right now, but get ready to fire on this one. <laughs> if the number that opens is respectable. All right, next up, we've got the Guardians. We got the Rays and feels like Tampa's been on the road for the past month. But alas, they're back in the trop in a matchup versus Cy Young winner Shane Bieber. And boy, does this total stand out for me. Six and a half runs? Six and a half. 
it's more than justified for Bassett and Alcantara in, in Miami, but this one grades out north of seven for me for a few reasons. One, Jeffrey Springs returned from the IL. He only went 78 pitches his last time out, meaning as good as the Southpaw's been this season, there's a chance some weaker pitchers than he is are forced into duty out of that uh, out of that Tampa be- uh, bullpen earlier than normal. And that's a big deal because Cleveland is second worst in baseball versus lefties with their 76 WRC plus, but eighth best in baseball versus righties with a 108 WRC plus. So if Springs can't give them five or six innings of work, that's a huge downgrade for this race team as they want a Southpaw out there as long as possible. And they don't have enough coming out of the pen. And two, I'm not sure Shane Bieber deserves this sort of respect against Tampa Bay, who just got their best bat in lefty Brandon Lau back into the fold here recently. And they still sport a 101 WRC plus despite playing half of their games in the trop. So it's been a hot second since any sort of a lock here, but I'm ready to go lock button the over of six and a half in this spot. I get that it's the Tropicana field and I get that both of these guys are above average pitchers, but these offenses aren't complete nobodies. So we are firing this one up in bulk. That is the over of six and a half. Lock it in. We go to Fenway next with one amazing MLB pitcher in Brandon Woodruff on the Brewers facing one amazing AAA pitcher in Brian Bayo. I'm not kidding with Bayo either. The young 23-year-old has lit up the minors to the tune of a 34.2% K rate, a 210 average, and just a 1.18 whip. At the bigs, however, different story. A horror story, in fact. A 14.1% K rate, a 400 batting average given up, and a 2.50 whip? I had to double-check that a few times to make sure I wasn't hallucinating. Now, as a golfer, I don't want to use the Y word. I really, really don't. But I think it's pretty clear Bayo has the yips. Said it. There it is. He desperately needs a matchup against the Tigers or the Athletics or something like that to get out of this rut he's in after some really bad stints. Tampa, Tampa, Toronto. Alas, the Brewers are who he gets, and they are damn good against righties with a 110 WRC plus that is seventh in baseball, and their 190 ISO against that handedness is third best. Add in that the Brew Crew has Woodruff going for them, unequivocally one of the best pitchers in baseball over the last couple years, and I'm very surprised to see minus 165 be the prevailing number that exists across the industry. That makes this clearly, clearly a play on the Brew Crew money line, And the only thing that holds me back from straight up locking this is the chance that Bayo finds some sort of his minor league form out of the middle of nowhere, but more than likely he just gets blasted in this bet safely cashes. So there you go. Milwaukee money line. Like, all right, we go to Atlanta here. We've got the diamondbacks visiting the Braves. It's old school lefty versus new school righty Madison Bumgarner versus Kyle Wright. And I don't know what kind of a deal with the devil mad bum made before his last start against Washington, but it was a turn back the clock sort of performance, eight innings pitched nine K's and just two earned runs given up. And while we backed Arizona in that spot, let's just say there is a 0% chance that I expected that. And I have a 0% chance that I expect that to happen here against Atlanta or against Wright. Wright's finally found a way to start striking out batters here at the big league, big league level for the Braves. A 24.3% K rate, which might not sound like a, a lot amongst elite pitchers, but considering he hasn't sported a K rate above 20% in a single season through his four years in the show before this, I'll just say this bodes very, very well for him going forward. That's because he does all the small stuff really well. Most importantly to me, being he doesn't have atrocious numbers against lefties. A 3.77 xFIP against them compared to his 2.95 uh, xFIP versus righties does show a little bit of disparity, but that's still a pretty good number, and he strikes them out equally as well, and he doesn't have any glaring power issues to lefties either, which comes in handy considering that's exactly what the Diamondbacks should be rolling out here on Friday. As for Bungarner, I still think he's really bad. And I find it impossible to say he's shown us anything just because one good start. He's still got a 338 X Woba, a 446 expected slugging, and just a 17.3% K rate this season. Oh, and he's facing the Braves with a murderer's row of righties and Ronald Acuna, Austin Riley, Dansby Dansby Swanson, any catcher that they put out there. Do I really want to back them though as a minus 210 favorite or go to the run line? Not really. So this is a lot of fluff for nothing. We'll just call this a lean on minus one and a half on Atlanta, but it's simply a lean because there's not enough there on the bone for my liking. And what I'm sure was a horrific outcome for many 
The Oakland Athletics just swept the Houston Astros at home this week. Yep, 38 and 63 A's took three in a row off the 64 and 35 Stros in a pretty laughable way. But that's baseball, folks. And that's why when the value's right, you back the dogs. And boy, is the value right for me here. Sure, James Caprillion here taking the mound for the A's. He's terrible. 15.6% K rate, a 10.8% walk rate, and a 347 X Woba with 13 home runs given up despite half of his starts in pitcher friendly Oakland. That's not very good. But oh my God to Lance Lynn, who has been a roller coaster in his now eight, eight starts that he's got this season. He's got a 6.43 ERA that is going to positively regress, no doubt about it. But his K rate has fallen precipitously down to 21.8%, a far cry from the 27.5% rate he enjoyed last season. His hard hit is slightly up too, and this top of the order for the A's has surpassed my expectations, perhaps because they all want to get the hell out of there like Christian Bethencourt just did. All I'm saying is that you don't take shots against this. If you don't take shots against this version of Lance Lynn at Major Plus Money, I don't really know what we're doing here with these shows. So it doesn't look pretty. Hell, it doesn't even look right. But I am liking the Oakland money line in this spot. Not because I trust Oakland or anything, but because the range of out outcomes is wider for Lynn than is currently being represented in the market. So that is an Oakland money line somehow alike. Oh, hi, pitching. It's Robbie Ray of the Mariners taking on Justin Verlander of the Astros. And man, am I looking forward to this one? Not from a betting angle, because I don't think I have a single thing for you here. But just to double check that, let's talk through it. Robbie Ray has certainly regressed from his Cy Young form with the Jays last year. His 27.9% K rate is down, but still very solid. His walks are up to just a tick, uh, or they're just up a tick. And his ERA is a full run and change higher than it was in 2021. But his expected ERA is actually down 0.1 runs between 2021 and 2022. And the hard hits that plagued him earlier on in his career with Arizona are planking him no more with a 38.8% hard hit rate, drastically better than even he had in his Cy Young year last year. As for Verlander, just marry Kate Upton if you can is probably the main takeaway here because he just keeps crushing at age 39. In fact, his 1.86 ERA would be a career low for him in a season if the season ended today. That's just silliness. I mean, never retire, but both of these offenses I have a ton of respect for, making the seven over under a stay away from me. And do I want to go out of my way to pick on the Astros with some super contrarian stand with the Mariners? Not particularly. So this feels like a sit back and enjoy the ride type of game, where if I had to do anything, I would back the Mariners' money line, especially if Alvarez or Tucker or Altuve get the night off like we've seen them do of late. But then I'd have to reassess it. But as it stands, as of right now, it's just a lean on the Seattle money line. Probably not going to be a play for me. We go to Coors Field once more. Dodgers, Rockies. Yeah, Jose Urania was terrible on Thursday. So that felt good to convert. Just like everybody else. I hope you guys just slammed everything that had to do with Dodgers. And call it a square play if you want. I don't really care. I said this yesterday. I said it earlier in this video. Sometimes the easy play is the right play which brings us to today because I have no idea how I'm not going to be backing the Dodgers every which way once more. It's Chad cool on the mound for the Rockies. Oh man, this Dodgers lineup is just too good. And Chad cool is too bad. A 16.8% K rate, a 9.5% walk rate to go with a boatload of heart contact peripherals. That just means the Dodgers should have their way for a second straight night with the starting pitcher in Coors and Julio Urias with the exception of one blip, on the radar against the Cubs, and another one here in Coors Field in his first start of the season. He's just been lights out this year with the exception of those two. He's got a 29.4% hard hit rate, which is exactly what you're looking for to find success in the thin Colorado air. And that's what we're getting here. So if I can just see him survive CJ Crone and Chris Bryant like every other softball, uh, Southpaw ever has to, this spells another lock play for me, minus one and a half Dodgers. That's exactly what we're going to do. Lock button minus one and a half on the Dodgers side with no play on the total this time around as I have too much stuff, uh, too much respect for Urias uh, in this spot. But that is Dodgers minus one and a half lock button, folks. Three to go. We're getting there. And it's two lefties who have certainly surpassed expectations this season in Martin Perez for the Rangers and Pablo Sandoval for the Halos. Going to Perez first, he just gets the job done despite his lack of strikeout stuff. His 335 expected slugging and 280x Woba should bode very well in Anaheim, and it's hard to see him failing miserably against a Troutless Angels lineup. 
And Sandoval, uh, Sandoval on the other side has been walking too many batters, no doubt, with at least two given up in every single start for him since May 22nd. But that 10.3% walk rate is more than made up for by his 24.1% strikeout rate and 35.5% hard hit rate that have made him a very serviceable big league pitcher. But for the umpteenth time this week, I must remind you how much better the Rangers offense has been this month, especially because Marcus Stroman has rejoined the land of the living. Since July 1st, Texas has a 105 WRC plus and a 176 ISO as a team under all circumstances. Before that time frame, just a 96 WRC plus and a 155 ISO. In other words, hello, Adolis Garcia. Hello, Corey Seager and company. We're backing you in Anaheim tonight at plus money. So keep doing your thing. Keep getting after it. Get after Sandoval here in this spot, who, if he's not getting strikeouts, certainly still has blowout potential both in walks and giving up some hits. So to repeat, that's a like play from me on this Rangers money line. My Minnesota Twins, yes, my Minnesota Twins, take a trip down to San Diego, which makes me really want to get a dog sitter and drive down there last second for the weekend. Anyway, let's talk baseball. It's the Twins' best starter and Joe Ryan on the bump, taking on Blake Snell. And to tell you the respect that the books have for young Joe Ryan, he's only a slight plus money dog here on the road against Blake Snell, former Cy Young winner Blake Snell. But Ryan's earned it. A sub-3 ERA, a 1.05 whip, giving up just a hair over four hits per start. I'm encouraged by what we've seen out of him this season. And the Snellivator has been especially bumpy this season. A 13.5% walk rate is the highest of his career. And his 4.75 ERA and his 29.1% K rate, while elite, is the lowest he's put on display at the big since 2017. And the Twins undoubtedly have the better lineup top to bottom. So this becomes a clear play on the dog for me. In fact, it's so clear that it's a lock play for me. Yes, friends, lock in the dogs from Minnesota. Lock, bud. We finish off our night in pitcher-friendly San Francisco where Marcus Stroman of the Cubs takes on the unluckiest pitcher ever in Alex Cobb. And I still do mean that. I've meant it before. I mean it now. As it's hard to run into a pitcher with as elite of stat cast data as we've seen out of him. Check this out. A 312 X Wobicon, a 312 expected slugging, and just a 3.1% barrel rate. That's as good as it can possibly get. And yet, his 2.88 expected ERA has resulted in a 4.26 ERA, which seems all kinds of unfair, especially when you think about a starter in San Francisco day in, day out. And with the possibility of 94 Cubs being traded between now and next week, who knows what this lineup's going to look like for them. And I hate saying this normally. I just don't like the narrative thing, but how motivated these hitters should be in this spot, I don't really know. Plus, it's not like Marcus Stroman is any good. He's not good. 413 expected slugging, a 45.8% hard hit. At least he's in a pitcher's park, in a, uh, the best pitcher's park in America, and his strikeout has spiked to a 23.3% rate, uh, rate this season, which is the highest of his career, but all in all. I know that I kind of got out of sorts there, but with the Giants platooning everybody all the time against everybody, It'll be a lot of lefties to rotate through, and Marcus Stroman is not doing so well in that department. So like most righties, he's given up more average, more power to that side, making me interested in a small backing of the Giants' money line. Nothing crazy to finish out our night. It's a little bit more juice than I want to be paying, but it still grades, grades out as a decent bet for me and could improve based on some unforeseen Cub trade news that exists on Friday. So San Francisco money line, that's a like, could be even higher though, pending what that lineup looks like for the Cubs. And that does it for another edition of Lindy's Leans, Likes, and Locks. Let me know in the comments section below what you thought of my plays. Let me know your favorite plays that exist on the board here for Friday. It's going to be a great day of baseball. Looking forward to it. But I look forward to you guys checking out BetMGM. Use promo code Lindy. Do not forget to take advantage. Just three days left. Three days left to take advantage of that. Bet $10 on any money line over there. Get $200 put into your account. No strings attached. Guarantee yourself a win on Friday. I'm Eric Lind well, should be able to say my name to finish it out. I'm Eric Lindquist. I'm not going to redo that. Best of luck in the MLB streets tonight.